Um, my name is Hal Roth. I direct the Contemplative Studies Initiative and in Concentration. Um, maybe uh, some of you, of course, know about Contemplative Studies, but perhaps some of you do not. So I'd like to say a few words before introducing our speaker for this evening. Uh, in Contemplative Studies, we look at human contemplative uh, practices and experiences across cultures and across traditions, and we approach them from humanistic, scientific, and artistic perspectives. We have developed a particularly unique uh, form of pedagogy we call integrative contemplative pedagogy. And with that, we look at these contemplative practices in their contexts. Uh, we look at them from third-person points of view that we find throughout the university, looking at history and philosophy and a, a variety of other factors. Uh, we also look at them from what we call critical first-person perspectives. In critical first-person perspectives, we actually uh, teach students uh, direct experience of uh, contemplative techniques in the classroom. Uh, what we, however, uh, we ask them to uh, learn the, the contemplative practices. Uh, they read about what the uh, the framework, the cognitive frameworks, the philosophical frameworks are for those practices, but we do not ask them to believe in the truth of those uh, cognitive frameworks. That's something that students are encouraged to do uh, on their own, to test out empirically in the lab of their bodies and minds. Um, we have a very active series of uh, lectures and uh, workshops. Uh, I want to mention also that we're very honored not only uh, to have Pierre Zia uh, this evening to give a lecture, but he will also be leading a workshop tomorrow. It's in the Crystal Room in Alumni Hall from uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you have not yet registered, uh, it will be possible. You can register tonight uh, online, or you can uh, come to the door and uh, register uh, and enter uh, tomorrow morning if you do not yet, uh, if you have not yet done that. Um, we have a number of events coming up uh, that if you go to our website, uh, you can find information about. You can also sign up uh, to get emails about our uh, events. Um, on Tuesday, the 13th of October, so a little less, a little, around 10 days, the, uh, the, the famous uh, American Zen poet Jane Hirschfeld is going to be giving a poetry reading. Um, it's co-sponsored with the uh, Department of Literary Arts. And then on the 21st of October, we're going to have an open house and a welcome back to some of our graduates, um, in part to tell the larger university community about the Contemplative Studies concentration, which we uh, have developed, and also to indicate uh, to students that there is life after university if you concentrate in contemplative studies. Um, our, our graduates have gone into a variety of um, uh, professional schools or occupations, and that's going to be um, on uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, we, we're going to provide food um, uh, that evening from 6.30 to 9, and it's going to be upstairs um, in Smith Banana 201. <coughs> It is a great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our speaker for this evening, uh, Pierre Zia Inyat Khan. Um, and actually, in order to give a proper introduction, I'm going to first introduce my colleague uh, in Islamic uh, religion from uh, the Religious Studies Department here, Professor Nancy Kalik. Thanks, Hal. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, it's rather fortuitous that I'm uh, giving this introduction. I was planning on attending the talk, but this afternoon I was in the department and I, I smelled the wonderful smell of incense, so I knew that Hal was in the office. And I knocked on his door and said, Hal, I smelled that you were here. And we got to talking about our teaching and about our lives. And um, when I expressed my pleasure about this evening's program and started talking about how this was relevant to the courses that I myself am teaching this semester on Islam in America and on Islamic sectarianism, Hal said, would you like to do the introduction? And I immediately uh, got to work in putting it together. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here tonight and to see you all. And I just, I'm only going to speak for a few short minutes 
um, about some of the, the history that has brought us here tonight. Our esteemed guest's grandfather, Hazrat Anayat Khan, who was born in 1882, visited the US from 1910 to 1912, and then again in the 1920s for a lecture tour, which included uh, a stop at Columbia University uh, and a musical performance there as well. So your being here tonight is part of a long tradition that is more than a century old. Hazrat Inayat Khan funded, founded the Sufi Order of the West in 1914, and this coincided with a, an important moment in American history that also included the arrival on American shores of a number of Sufi movements, including the Ahmadiyya Muslim movement, which was founded by Mirza Ghulam Hussein in 1880, but really made popular in the US by his disciple, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Uh, and like the Sufi order that our guests' ancestors brought here, this helped pave the way for various interpretations of Islam in America. Today's tradition, uh, or the one that we're learning the most about today, the Sufi Order of the West, now called the Sufi Order International, is one of the oldest continuous Sufi, Sufi organizations in the United States. Uh, our guest, Pir, Inayat, Pir Zia Inayat Khan, who was born in 1971, took over uh, leadership of the organization in guiding Sufi communities in North and South America, Europe, the Middle East, and even in the South Pacific, in traditions that connect contemplative wisdom from various strains of uh, mystical thinking, but also just contemplative traditions, and helping to link them with the solutions to problems that contemporary society faces, with an emphasis on responding to the urgent social challenges of the day. The spirit of our, of our guest grandfather, who arrived in the US at a time in which, in his own words, the time was not yet ripe for the message that he brought, is in many ways still with us today. Hazrat Anayat Khan remarked on the pace and busyness of life in America, was critical of the superficiality with which many approached spiritual teachings from abroad, and was sensitively attuned to the racism suffered particularly by African Americans, and wrote that he felt kinship as an Indian with brown skin, who at times was also looked upon with contempt. Sadly, we are now in another important moment in the history of the relationship between the broad and vast tradition that is Islam and the United States. And the social challenges of that era are in many ways still with us and have even been exceeded. We are in a period of disenchantment with Islam, both from within the Muslim community and without. The message of universal Sufism, based on the unity of all people and religions and the spiritual guidance that is uh, present in all people and places, still apparently has a lot of work to do and much to offer us to enliven and reanimate the spirit of the vast religious tradition called Islam, whose vibrance has recently been threatened by the politicized and violent manifestations of that tradition that receives so much attention these days, whether in the form of the brutality of militants or in the dry, litigious, exclusive, and absolutist claims of Saudi Wahhabism. Also in the first decades of the 20th century, the Orientalist A.J. Vensink, as my students who are in the audience know, opined that if not for the flourishing of Sufism, or what is sometimes commonly called the mystical tradition of Islam, even though that is an oversimplification, if not for Sufism, he said, the Muslim religion would have become a lifeless form. That was in a book that was published in 1932 called The Muslim Creed. Nearly 85 years later, the words of that Orientalist scholar, perhaps offensive then, seem to ring true now, but for different reasons. At a time in which religion is experiencing a revival, it is also undergoing tremendous change and needs uniting impulses that can speak to global audiences and address the urgent social, political, and environmental challenges that today feel more pressing than ever. Our guest tonight is the author and editor of numerous essays and books, too many to enumerate here, but uh, I urge you to go look at the website peerzia.org for a complete list and for a sense of the breadth of uh, knowledge that is available there. He has also formed the Seven Pillars House of Wisdom, a diverse community that draws on various contemplative traditions in the service of humanity's needs, and also is an integral contributor to other interfaith collaborations and conversations. Please join me in welcoming Pirzia and Ayat Khan.
Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor, for your, your very kind and inspiring words. I feel very, uh, very motivated now to plunge into the subject that um, was on my mind because you have framed it so, uh, so perfectly. And um, I'd like to express my special thanks uh, to you, Professor Roth, who, who, of whom I have known by reputation for some time. And um, that uh, knowledge has drawn me here with the, with the great expectation of, of meeting you at last and coming into the presence of your, your students and, and colleagues. So it's a delight to, to be here. And um, your introduction, as I say, really did set the stage so, so perfectly for what I wish, wish to speak about, because you spoke about um, the contemporary problematic facing uh, Islam, and particularly Islam vis-a-vis -vis the West, uh, which we see in terms of the, the disenchantment um, reflected in public opinion about Islam and Muslims among people in, in Western nations. And we also see the, the turmoil, the, the political and, uh, and uh, military turmoil in the M Middle East as a as a prominent um, crisis in our in our age, and um, the the recent wars in in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, the ongoing uh, trouble in uh, in Syria and 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 in Iraq uh, point to uh, a, a an, an agitation in those heartlands which are the originating uh, place, the original homeland of the great prophetic traditions that have influenced so much not only our Western civilization, but also uh, the cultures of India and um, Southeast Asia and, and Africa. There we find in, in what we call the Middle East, the, the homeland of the Beni Israeli prophetic tradition. And when we consider relations between the adherents of the three major branches of these prophetic traditions, uh, the, the Jewish people, the uh, Christians, and the Muslims, we see that those relations are as fraught today as they ever were. And in fact, we are reminded of the tragedy of the, of the Crusades and, and the great uh, loss of life and, and um, Violent, uh, not only rhetoric but um, but uh, warfare between European peoples and and um, Arab peoples, and um, something of that the memory of that conflict is aroused in us when we consider contemporary events. And I have reflected upon that that um, symmetry over time. And um, this has led me to re-read um, a book which belongs to the great literature of the Middle Ages, the literature of the Grail legends, and particularly to um, re-examine a work of the Grail genre um, which emerged just after the unsuccessful Fourth Crusade, when Europe was in a state of deep despondency because of the failure of that crusade, the failure of this effort to reclaim Jerusalem, which had captured the imagination of, of Christendom, and then which fell flat, uh, leading to a sense of, of impotence and, and cultural hopelessness. Well, then came uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach's uh, great interpretation of the Parsifal legend. And as we know, there have been number, a number of uh, versions of that legend, uh, the earlier one of Chrétien de Troyes, uh, most notably. But, um, but Wolfram's version adds a, an extremely important element, which is the backstory. Now, Parsifal by then was very well known as the, the grail hero, 
the, the champion who at last attains the grail after years of, of searching. But uh, what Wolfram shows us is that Parsifal had a brother, a half-brother. And he learned this from a, a bard named Kiot uh, of Provence, who himself was said to have learned it from a discarded Arabic manuscript in Toledo, uh, which was the work of a certain Phlegetanis, who was known to be an astrologer, a, a mystic apparently, quite possibly a Sufi. So this uh, hidden story of the grail reveals that um, the father of, of Parsifal, before Parsifal was born, had gone to Baghdad and there had served the, the caliph of Baghdad. Uh, so this quintessential Christian knight had been in the service of a Muslim king and on further adventures had gone on to Africa to the kingdom of Zazamank and uh, there had, had rescued the queen. And um, upon rescuing her, uh, the two fell in love and were married and had a child. But this uh, Angevin prince was um, one to roam. He was never happy to put down roots. So he left his new wife and, and child and went on his way, returned to Europe, and there married again. And uh, his um, Christian wife also bore him a child. And uh, subsequently, he he died in, in an attempt actually to returning to, to Baghdad to defend Baghdad, he died there. So he left two children. The child born to the Christian mother was Parsifal, but he had this prior son of which Christendom was completely unaware until, uh, until Wolfram brought, brought forth this story. And this son was named Firefiz. Uh, he, he was notable for his party-colored skin. He was half black and half white in patches. And eventually, when he grew up, he went in search of his father. And uh, in the course of some adventures, he came across Parsifal in a glade. Now, Parsifal had been seeking the grail for years, four and a half years precisely. Uh, because he had once encountered the Grail Castle and had, be had been shown the Grail and was dazzled, but he failed to answer the right question. And um, so the Grail withdrew, the castle disappeared, <coughs> and he was left in a state of utter frustration and sought frantically to, to recover that ultimate experience. So it was in the midst, midst of this ongoing quest that he came across a Saracen knight. Now, that word Saracen was the word used in, in those times to refer to the, the Muslims or Arabs. And um, in fact, um, although etymologically it really should be traced back to, um, uh, to another route um, in the mythology in the legends, it's traced to the island Ceres, and I'll come back to that because it's an important um, symbol. The island Ceres um, was explained as the origin of the word uh, Saracen, and that island was known as the island of the Grail. That was the island to which uh, Galahad brought back the Grail uh, after he had attained it. So here was a Saracen knight confronting a Christian knight, and um, they fell at each other, um, swinging and clanging their swords. And um, at last, um, Parsifal's sword broke in two. So he was rendered helpless. And uh, Firefiz had the upper hand. He could have dealt the final blow. But instead, he practiced futua, or Sufi chivalry. He sheathed his sword. He didn't take advantage of his advantage. And the two sat down to talk. They removed their helmets, and uh, Parsifal asked, who are you? He said, uh, Firef is the Angevin. He said, how could you be an Angevin? I am Parsifal. I am the Angevin. And so they got to 
uh, talking and uh, realized at last they had the same father. Just as soon as that realization came, Parsifal took Firefiz to Arthur's camp and he was warmly welcomed there. He was made a knight of the round table. And then came Kundri with the message that they were called to the Grail Castle. And so this quest which, uh, which Parsifal had pursued for, for so long now reached its conclusion. And why did it reach its conclusion? Because the two brothers were united. Now, there is significance in this story. And it, it's significant that it came at the end of the Fourth Crusade. Why? Because here is shown the moral that the grail which symbolizes attainment, the grail which symbolizes salvation, is found in the reconciliation of two lines of the Abrahamic prophetic family. That is to say that salvation which was sought by a conquest of the Holy Lands needs to be redirected toward a process of reconciliation and spiritual re reunification. That is what this version that draws upon the backstory shows. And so it's a version which evokes a kind of chivalry which is common to all three of these civilizations. And it's a chivalry which is traced back to the prophet Abraham. The Sufi text refers specifically to Abraham as the founder of chivalry. So we have chivalry understood in Sufism and in the myth of, of Parsifal. Parsifal becomes, upon, upon attaining the grail, he becomes the new grail keeper and, and Firefiz is married to the, 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 the maiden who is the holder of the grail. And so there is a, a, a triumphal conclusion. And that conclusion, as I say, is a piece of evidence which, together with the evidence of Futua in Sufism, uh, points to an understanding that was held by some in the Middle Ages and which has been elaborated and um, explored in great detail in the Sufi texts, uh, that there exists a tradition of ethical ex excellence and spiritual spiritual kinship between the people of the Abrahamic family, despite the political uh, differences between the, the, the empires that um, determine the fate of these peoples. So that subject is one that um, it has been for me a great um, interest to, to explore and Exploring it has revealed a, a, just a wealth of, of um, legends and lore and syntheses of, on the one hand, Stoic Greek philosophy, on the other hand, the biblical lore that was transmitted into Islam through um, rabbis who were consultants to the earlier early uh, followers of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, this was called the Israeliat, the lore that was inherited from Judaism. And, um, and then even contacts with uh, Christendom. But primarily, uh, the, the Islamic uh, revelation itself through the Quran and the Sunnah, combined with uh, the influx of, of Hellenistic knowledge and infused with the lore of the Hanafiya, who were the, uh, the, the desert mystics who were not Christians or Jews, but who were definitely monotheists and who were mystics, who, who practiced a practice called Tahannuth, uh, which was the practice that uh, the Prophet Muhammad practiced uh, during Ramadan when the first revelation came to him. He was in a cave uh, in the mountain called Jabal Nur, practicing a vigil and, and, and fasting and experiencing, pr practicing uh, meditative methods which belong to this, uh, this community of the Hanifs, 
So Ramadan, for instance, has a history prior to Islam. So there were these uh, methods of spiritual practice. So it is from this Hanif tradition. And remember, Ibrahim, salam, the Abraham is named as a Hanif in the Quran. He's also named as a Muslim. This, uh, this spiritual tradition, which precedes the differentiation of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, is traced back to Abraham as the founding figure of two lines. And these two lines are what you could call Sufism, or also call it Irfan, which is the inner meditative transcendent practice. And on the other hand, the ethical practice of valiant engagement with the external world and which uh, meshes so well with um, aspects of Greek philosophy that um, Stoicism explores, for instance, and which gave rise eventually to a whole literature in, in Islam of akhlaq, akhlaq meaning, meaning um, ethics, a whole body of ethical knowledge which overlaps with this tradition of futua. And both of these things, the mystical interiority and the ethical um, excellence traced back to Abraham in this way that um, Abraham attracted seekers who were moved by his charisma, his, his magnetism, and saw in him a special wisdom. And some of them were ready to give up everything and to uh, go into seclusion and to practice long vigils and to, to fast and so forth. And so he readily accepted these disciples and trained them and uh, tutored them, and uh, they became advanced mystics. But there were other people, according to the lore, there were other people who uh, were unable or unwilling to make that um, vow because they had duties in the world. They had families. They were pillars of society. And so they asked for a special dispensation. They wanted Abraham's knowledge, but not, um, not the restriction that would come with a lifelong vow of um, renunciation. And so um, Abraham took in that request. And um, the, the legend goes that he swam out over the sea. I think we can understand this as a vision that he experienced. He swam out into the sea. And of course, the nearest sea uh, for him was the Mediterranean. And he found an island. And he established that island as the headquarters, as it were, the fortress of a new lineage, which would be known as Futua, chivalry. Uh, so he, he established a sacred territory, which would be the, the, the planetary center for a new spiritual education. And uh, that's why I wanted to mention earlier on Ceres and the link with Saracens, because um, we can see some uh, correspondence between these legends and understand that the, the island that he found was, was Ceres, the Grail Island, and which became in, in Sufism the, the basis of the, the tradition of Futua. Uh, Futua then uh, comes forth from Abraham and uh, exists side by side with what is generally known as tasawwuf, or Sufism, which is, again, the, the, the meditative, contemplative, internally oriented spiritual work. Side by side with that is futua. Now, sometimes those two things have become so close together that they're indistinguishable. And certainly, tasawwuf, Sufism, contains a lot of futua, and futua contains a lot of Sufism. But it can be useful to, to differentiate them. So what is Futua? Well, it was passed on uh, by Abraham to his descendants. And the legends describe how it was passed on when he, he gave up all his, uh, his worldly goods. He gave up all that he had, which had been meant, had been intended for his um, son. Uh, actually, there were, there were uh, two sons, um, Isaac and uh, and Ishmael, but um, he gave up all that he owned 
and um, as their patrimony tied round their waist a sash which represented Futua. So instead of giving them things, he gave them an ideal, the ideal of generosity and courage. That's how uh, Futua was, was later defined, actually by the Prophet Muhammad. Hazrat Ali asked him, O Prophet, what is Futua? And he answered, it is a nobility that ennobles uh, the, the generous and the courageous. And so that uh, sash came to symbolize this vow of generosity and courage. And it was passed down through the family of, of Abraham, which came to include a number of the biblical prophets, um, including Moses and Jesus. And according to this legend, uh, Jesus, having received this uh, sash, uh, passed it on to his apostles. And it eventually reached uh, the monk Bahira, who preserved it. And when the young Prophet Muhammad um, encountered Bahira, Bahira presented it to him. And so this prophetic tradition of chivalry continued through Islam traced back to Abraham, now infused into this new Islamic civilization. And this uh, method of chivalry determined um, the ethical boundaries for the followers of Muhammad, and also established terms on which they could realize um, harmony with the followers of the other Abrahamic lineages. So, there are ethical uh, commitments that transcend matters of belief, even if the different communities differed in their uh, tenets. They could agree on the necessity of certain um, ethical principles. And uh, these, these principles have been um, articulated in great uh, detail in the manuals of Futua. Um, but uh, one can, uh, can uh, identify a certain basic core of virtues. And those, those virtues are actually uh, identical with the, the cardinal virtu virtues of the Hellenistic world. So we have wisdom, we have justice, and then we have temperance and courage. And as I say, the Prophet Muhammad especially emphasized the latter two, temperance and courage, or generosity and courage, because in the classical accounts, generosity is part of temperance. Temperance means, of course, moderation, and not uh, indulging in what in Futua and Sufism would be called the, the impulses of the nafs alamara, which is to say the commanding self, that kind of narcissistic, um, trait in all of us, which just wants what it wants and will will do whatever it can to obtain satisfaction without any consideration of anyone else. So the whole work of Fatua is to try to bring under control that um, avaricious, uh, lusty, greedy tendency, and and to do so not by repressing it, pushing it down, and, and, uh, and um, blasting it away, but rather bringing to the fore the uh, nafs al-lawama, which is reflective, which is uh, contemplative, which considers all angles of a situation, and especially the nafs al-mutma'ina, which is that aspect of ourself which is at its ease because it is in a state of grace, and, and that's the dimension of the self that can be, can be cultivated and brought to the fore through meditative practice. So Futua involves um, a kind of rigorous uh, ethical self-examination, but it also includes the cultivation of contemplative techniques which animate soul qualities um, that uh, direct human uh, thought and behavior along lines that are you know, providential and in accordance with our fitra, our uh, divine nature. 
So these two qualities in particular, temperance and temperance and generosity, and then also courage. And there are such wonderful uh, stories in the lore of Futuo that, that illustrate these, these virtues. And many of the stories have to do with the figure of Hazrat Ali, who was the son-in-law of, uh, of the Prophet, and who after the Prophet was um, in the Shia tradition, was his immediate successor in the Sunni tradition, was the, uh, the, a, la a later caliph, but um, who in any case was very close to uh, the Prophet and um, in fact was the husband of his daughter Fatima. And so there are many stories that um, describe the futua of Hazrat Ali and of Fatima, their generosity, their courage, and, and so forth. One of these is how um, when the prophet was um, under siege and there was a plan to uh, assassinate him, his enemies planned to kill him in his sleep, um, the circle around him got wind of it and they spirited him away but they couldn't let it be known that he had gone. So someone had to sleep in his bed. And of course, Hazrat Ali volunteered. And not only, they say, did he sleep in that bed, not only did he lie in that bed, but he actually slept in that bed. So that was evidence of his faith. And uh, well, my favorite story about uh, Hazrat Ali is um, actually one that is uh, very well known and celebrated in Sufi circles. It's told by uh, Molana Rumi in his Masnavi. And that is the story of how during a certain battle, uh, uh, Hazrat Ali was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with his foe and um, he managed to disarm his foe and, or, or at least knock him over and was about to, to um, deal the final blow when the, the um, enemy spat in his face as just a final insult before, before dying. Um, and the code of Murua, which was the pagan desert code of that time, which called for an eye for an eye at the very least, it was a, a code of vendetta, of blood feuds, that would have called for, that, 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 that insult should have been answered with, uh, with a, a, terrible, um, a, a terrible punishment. Uh, uh, that uh, the, the one who gave that insult should, ha should have been absolutely humiliated. But no, what did Hazrat Ali do? He sheathed his sword and turned and walked away. So this, um, this uh, soldier on the battlefield was, was baffled and uh, he rose up and chased after him and demanded to, to know how, how can this be? Why did you do this? And um, Hazrat Ali answered, yes, I was going to take your life as duty called me to do. But when you spat in my face, you aroused my anger. And I'm sworn not to act in anger. So I had to sheathe my sword. So that's a key tenet of, of um, chivalry, of futua, that whatever you do, you have to, sometimes you have to engage in conflict. You have to defend yourself, you have to defend others, you have to, uh, to meet uh, the challenge of injustice and tyranny, you have to stand on the battlefield when there is necessity. You should never do so aggressively, you should never unjustly um, assert yourself. But um, there will be a time when you have to stand uh, forth for what is true. But then you must do so without any spirit of enmity. And just as soon as such an emotion enters your heart, you've got to sheathe your sword and walk away because you're no longer in the right. So that's a key principle of, uh, of this futua. And in fact, um, one of the sayings of, the sh of one of the sheikhs is that uh, the fatah, which is to say the chivalrous youth, that's the word that, that um, refers to a practitioner of chivalry, fatah. It means a, y a young man. 
there's also Anissa, which is a young woman. And there's not only Fatua or young manliness, but there's also Nisyan or, or young womanliness. But why young? Is it only that young people can do this? It means youngness of spirit. It means that you're not jaded, you're not cynical. You have that young kind of valiant spirit of rising up and, and facing life. So you could be a, uh, chronologically a, an elderly um, person, but if you have that, uh, that eternal life in you, that youthfulness, then you are a fatah. And the fatah is, uh, is defined as the one who has no enemy. Does that mean that the fatah is someone that has the good fortune that no one is giving him or her a hard time? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that uh, even in the midst of conflict and, and war and so forth, that one does not succumb to enmity, to malice, the sense of antagonism. One is ready to forgive. One is ready to resolve uh, the conflict on just terms at any moment. So that is a, a key principle. That together with, as I say, generosity. And there the, the great uh, example is Hatim Tai. Hatim Tai, who uh, was the celebrated um, hero of many uh, pre-Islamic legends. Actually, Hatim Tai lived in the era just before the Prophet Muhammad. He was a Christian. But he was, his memory was uh, cherished among the Muslims because he symbolized the epitome of generosity. He was always giving freely. So perhaps I'll, I'll tell you briefly the story of Hatim Tai's uh, marriage. Uh, he came to know of a, an eligible young lady who um, was attractive in every way and went to go bring forward his suit. But as soon as he arrived at her encampment, well, he wasn't the only one. So there were many suitors all camped around, all pressing for her favor. So um, she welcomed them all courteously and uh, said, well, will you just each recite a poem describing your virtues, your merits? So they all did that. They all spoke uh, very eloquently of, of uh, their many virtues. And then she said, oh, thank you. Now um, I've got to go reflect on what I've heard, but you'll be the guest of my father here and just go to your tent and some dinner will be brought to you. So they each retreated to their tents. And then, um, so some camels were slaughtered. That's what was generally eaten in those times. And um, then a kind of uh, hideous um, uh, woman hobbled about from tent to tent and was um, um, g giving them, um, and well, they, ha they had received their food, but then a as they received the, the feast that was given to them, there was this hideous woman who kept begging at the door of them all for something. And uh, so they just kept throwing her whatever scraps, a kind of gizzard or whatever unappetizing morsels they had, um, except for Hatim, Tai. When he saw that old lady, he, he just took the, the, the prime, what would you call it, the, the, the choice uh, viand. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't have the vocabulary for this. Uh, so some kind of prime piece of meat and uh, offered it. And the next day, so then all of the, she took it and went her way. The next day, well, it turns out um, you know, that she was, maybe she was in disguise. That old lady was someone else. And when all of the suitors were gathered there, she said, now we'll have a, have a feast and you'll be served. Each one of you will be served. So. Each was given something, and what they were given was exactly what they had given to that uh, old lady. And Hatim Tai was given this uh, delightful morsel. And so they were all just so embarrassed, they, they went their way, and Hatim won the day and uh, won his bride. And uh, so there are many stories like that, and some of them do involve meat. Uh, another <laughs> one, uh, one more, even though uh, I, I'm not partial to meat myself, um, the stories are, are so attractive that uh, one can't keep away from them. Um, the other one is a story of the Prophet Muhammad, which is um, that uh, he was given uh, a, a slaughtered sheep, I think it was, 
uh, as a gift, and um, it was to be divided. It was it was for his family, and but then he took it and, and divided it up and wanted to give it out, give all the different parts to neighbors and the poor and so forth, and just kept the worst part for himself and his family, which was the neck. And there was someone in his family who was a little frustrated about that and said, oh, you've given all of the good parts and all we have is the neck. But he said, no, no. The neck is what we don't have. We have all the rest. So the principle there is what you give is what you have. You know, when you left this world, we're all going to leave this world sooner or later, maybe sooner than we think. And when we li leave this world, what we've taken for ourselves, we won't have that. That will be gone. But what we give, that's ours in some real way. Whatever you give, that's yours. So that's the principle behind giving, that um, we really ought to give as much as we possibly can, because in doing so, it's we, ourselves, that, um, you know, that grow fr from, from doing so. So these are some of the principles of uh, Futua. And um, so it, it uh, continued through history since, well, since its revival in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And um, some of the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad were sent forth then to different lands, one to Persia, one to Egypt, one, I think, to Greece. And they carried those lineages to different places, while meanwhile, Sufi successors carried the Sufi message uh, to different lands. And oftentimes, these missions overlapped, and Sufis were also um, they were also masters of Futua Ahis. And um, so the tradition of Sufism that uh, comes down through my grandfather also has this element of Futua in it. And um, this is reflected in a number of his teachings on, on moral culture and, in fact, in some rules that he prescribed, which are really reflections for ethical self-examination. Um, self so I thought to, to end uh, sharing those rules with you. But just before I do, um, I'll mention that, um, as I say, the, the Futua tradition was one that he continued, and uh, which he really um, planted the seeds for at the very end of his life, in 1926, just before leaving France for India, and he died in February 1927. Uh, uh, and um, before he did so, he revived Futua within his Western uh, Sufi <coughs> order. But the one who came after him and really championed that part of his lineage, certain other people brought forward other aspects of his legacy, but the one who, whose life was the living symbol of that Futua was his daughter, Nur Nisa, his eldest child. He had four children. And she um, grew up. She was a harpist. She played harp. She wrote stories for children. She studied child psychology. She wrote fairy tales. Very fine poetess and, and musician, um, already from a very early age, very self-sacrificing, very generous. She uh, composed a version of the Jataka tales uh, which are stories of uh, the Buddha incarnate as different animals, and in each case, the animal gives of itself for the sake of the other animals. So she, was, she had already imbibed this uh, bodhisattva tradition, you might say, through that literature, and also through her futua um, experience in the presence of her, her father. And, uh, but then came the, the Second World War, and the family had to withdraw from Paris to, to uh, England. And there she, uh, she volunteered for, and was recruited for, and, and, and trained for uh, the most uh, dangerous task in the Second World War, which was to be an undercover uh, operator in the resistance in occupied France, in Nazi-occupied Paris. And she, she, was, um, uh, she was flown in to a field at night and given an alias and connected with a, a circle in the resistance. But soon after her arrival, her circle was uh, swooped up, picked up, um, 
and uh, she, before long, became the sole link between the Allies and the resistance as a radio operator uh, sending signals, uh, sending messages. And so she would have to carry a, a suitcase through the streets of Paris at a time when her identity became known to the Nazis and they were looking for her. She had to carry that suitcase, set up her apparatus out of doors, couldn't be done indoors, and send uh, messages to, to London, to the SOE headquarters. And um, she was able to um, do so successfully for a time. And, um, that was a, a, a crucial contribution that she made even when she was asked to return. She was invited to return because it had become too dangerous. It was already, already when she went there, it was the most dangerous job in, in the war, but now uh, the noose was tightening around her and was urged to return, but she felt she was the last link she had to continue. So her, her commitment to, to Futua meant that she was ready to sacrifice herself. And that's what it came to because she was betrayed and uh, she was arrested, and uh, she was um, browbeaten, and, and uh, you know, she was subjected to the worst kind of interrogation that the Nazi police were capable of, under which you know, m many male spies had utterly broken down, uh, but she refused to give any information uh, to the last. She didn't give um, the code that um, would have been needed to uh, to confirm the authenticity of her messages played back on her machine, although they did play back those messages without those, th the code, and the SOE failed to, uh, to um, notice the absence of the bluff code. But uh, she didn't give any information, and she, was, she made two success, uh, unsuccessful escape attempts through a hatch, and, um, and at last was uh, taken to Forsheim prison and kept there for a number of months chained to a wall, her hands and feet were chained, and uh, unable even to feed herself or, or, or wash herself, and uh, then taken to Dachau and uh, put to death. And uh, as, she, as she was beaten uh, all night and then made to, made to kneel, and uh, her final word was the word liberté, her defiant word uh, against the tyranny, the, the, the horror of uh, the na Nazi ideology. And of course, liberté was an important word to her father. S spiritual liberty was the sign of his message, uh, the, 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 Sufi, the Sufi message of spiritual liberty, which is a, a freedom, freedom of the soul, but also freedom of all people, freedom from the, the oppression of uh, ideological, uh, political, and even um, uh, religious um, authoritarianism. And uh, so her final word summed up her, her life and her spirit of, of Futua when she declared uh, liberté. And uh, she has uh, remained a, a, an inspiration. And especially in more recent years, her story is becoming uh, better known and actually is, is making a mark in the Islamic world where she also she also represents um, the, the self-determination of a young woman, a, a, Muslim, a Muslim woman who, uh, who um, fought for um, democracy and uh, who was uh, committed to the spiritual uh, depths of the, uh, the tradition that she belonged to, but was also very much a, a contemporary um, liberated woman. Uh, so she is our mirror of chivalry uh, in, in our Futua. We have within our Sufi order a, a, a Futua order, the uh, order of knighthood within the Inayati, um, in, Inayati Tariqa, and she's our living symbol. And within this Futua of uh, the Inayati order, our primary practice is the rules that Hazrat Inayat Khan has, has given and which she lived by. So I thought I would close with those rules. And really these rules have to be understood not just as something that is imposed on uh, the one who practices them and, uh, and um, which require um, 
mere obedience. These are contemplations. These are subjects for reflection. In other words, an opportunity to examine one's life, examine one's relationship, examine one's conduct, and to see how well it matches with one's ideal. That is the, the picture of the, the utmost possibility of, of beauty in action, which is called ihsan in, in uh, Arabic, which is to say doing beauty. Husn is beauty. Ihsan is, is doing beauty. So that's the intention of these rules, uh, not just to blindly follow a dictate, but uh, each one begins with the, uh, the, 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 the salutation, my conscientious self. So one is speaking to oneself, one is asking this of oneself. So there are 10 iron rules, then 10 copper rules, 10 silver rules, and 10 golden rules. And I'll read through all of them, and, and then we'll be finished. And if there's time, we can perhaps have some discussion. My conscientious self, make no false claims. Speak not against others in their absence. Do not take advantage of a person's ignorance. Do not boast of your good deeds. Do not claim that which belongs to another. Do not reproach others, making them firm in their faults. Do not spare yourself in the work which you must accomplish. Render your services faithfully to all who require them. Seek not profit by putting someone in straits. Harm no one for your own benefit. My conscientious self, <coughs> consider your responsibility sacred. Be polite to all. Do nothing which will make your conscience feel guilty. Extend your help willingly to those in need. Do not look down upon the one who looks up to you. Judge not another by your own law. Bear no malice against your worst enemy. Influence no one to do wrong. Be prejudiced against no one. Prove trustworthy in all your dealings. Consider duty as sacred as religion. Use tact on all occasions. Place people rightly in your estimation. Be no more to anyone than you are expected to be. Have regard for the feelings of every soul. Do not challenge anyone who is not your equal. Do not make a show of your generosity. Do not ask a favor of those who will not grant it you. Meet your shortcomings with a sword of self-respect. Let not your spirit be humbled in adversity. Keep to your principles in prosperity as well as in adversity. Be firm in faith through life's tests and trials. Guard the secrets of friends as your most sacred trust. Observe constancy in love. Break not your word of honor, whatever may befall. Meet the world with smiles in all conditions of life. When you possess something, think of the one who does not possess it. Uphold your honor at any cost. Hold your ideal high in all circumstances. Do not neglect those who depend upon you. so much. It's a wonderful, wonderful, inspirational talk. Um, it looks like uh, we have a microphone over there. Um, if you'd like to uh, come up and stand at the microphone to ask questions, uh, that would probably be the easiest. So I would recommend doing that. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, uh, please just ask the question. It will go into the recording system if you, if you do speak into the microphone. Find your message appeals most in the work that you've been doing recently among 
non-Muslims were Muslims. Oh. Yes. Well. So as I mentioned, Hazrat Inayat Khan, my grandfather, he, he came from India. He came from Western India, from, from Gujarat, and underwent his spiritual training at the hands of a Sufi master in Hyderabad who initiated him, trained him, authorized him, and blessed him to go forth to, specifically to the Western world. And, and so uh, he went in 1910. And so for this, uh, for, 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 for a century, more than a century now, this particular silsila, this particular lineage has been functioning in the Western world. He, he traveled, as you mentioned, he first arrived in America. He was for two years in America, then in Europe. And so it's here that um, Hazrat Inayat Khan established his work. And in the course of that time, of course, he had to, two things were happening. One was that um, he was, first of all, he said when he, he arrived, he was um, studying the, the psyche of, 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 of Western, culture. So even before he was really teaching in earnest, he was, he was taking in this completely different world. And um, his first articulations of Sufism were very um, close to, if not identical, with the form in which Sufism was, was taught in India. But over time, as he, as he saw that this was a new environment, he adapted uh, the, the, f the outer form of, of his Sufism to meet the needs of, of the Western world. And um, for instance, he, he built upon a, uh, a tradition which um, existed prior to him in the Chishtia, the Chishti lineage of Sufism, which was that there had already been a dispensation within the Chishtia that um, spiritual training could be given to uh, non-Muslims. In India, it was Hindus, primarily. So, um, but in India, this was, uh, it, it happened, and, and there were some cases, there still are some cases in rural places where you find a, a peer in a village, and the Murids, half of them maybe are Hindus, half of them are Muslims, so that, that is there. But in the urban centers, well, uh, communities tend to be a bit uh, bifurcated, and actually that bifurcation is, is increasing in our time. So Muslim community and, and Hindu community are more and more divided. They used to be more culturally integrated in a kind of uh, what, what was called a Ganga Jamni synthesis, a synthesis of the, the uh, represented by the two great rivers of India. And they would share festivals and share, well, arts especially. And Hazrat Naid Khan came out of an artistic tradition, a tradition of classical Indian music. So he was, he was very, uh, very um, immersed in that kind of conjunction between cultures. But at the same time, even in Sufi circles, there were ones that weren't really part of that um, confluence, but were very much, uh, very much focused on the Islamic community, seen as something um, stretching from, from Mecca and Medina to India, to the exclusion of non-Muslim people. So there are Sufis that would operate primarily or even exclusively within a Muslim uh, a, a Muslim uh, religious context, whereas other Chishtis would, would open up space for people of other faiths. And Chishtis in particular, of, of the various uh, Sufi schools in India, um, were, were the tariqa that, that were in constant dialogue with Hindu civilization. Um, treatises on yoga were produced by Chishti masters, commentaries on a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita by a Shishti Sheikh of the 16th century. Um, so this kind of um, inter-civilizational synthesis was going on. And that was really the, the milieu out of which Hazrat Inayat Khan came through his music and, and his, his intercultural background. So he was one who was very much able to build upon that Chishti tradition of, of an open door and not framing uh, the inner culture, the, the riyazat, the spiritual practice and study of Sufism, exclusively in outer religious terms. But instead, he would, he would say that um, Sufism is the cultivation of the heart, 
and uh, people of all faiths are, um, are capable of receiving guidance in the cultivation of the heart and, and the Sufi path without requiring conversion on anyone's part could in fact shine a light on the tradition to which uh, a, a seeker belonged. So it would shine a light on, on the biblical teachings or uh, so forth. So we've seen already when we study Futua and the study of the, the early history of, of, of Sufism, we see it goes back to this prophetic family, which in any case has this common origin in, in, Abra in Abraham's prophecy. So it made little sense to Hazrat Inayat Khan to, uh, to imagine Sufism as something that uh, needed to be exclusively reserved for people of the Dini Muhammadi. You know, understanding Islam as, a, as in its essence being the planetary phenomenon of, of prophecy and, and the community of all those who follow prophecy, then there are different versions of Islam, you could say. There's the Musavi version, the version of Moses, which is Judaism, and then you've got the Isavi version and the, and the Muhammadi version. So in that spirit, uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan Sufism is universal. Uh, so it's, it, it, it has been open to, to people of all faiths, and certainly many, um, probably the majority over the last century of, of practitioners, certainly the majority, have not been Muslims. After all, America and, and Europe are majority non-Muslim countries, and only more recently are there increasing uh, uh, Muslim populations. So, um, and with those increasing populations, now many uh, the people of Muslim origin who are now established in the West become interested in Sufism here and, and take part. So in the early decades, when there were hardly any Muslims here, there were very few Muslims in this order. Um, and uh, so I would say that participation keeps pace with the composition of the population generally. How is it possible to continue to publish your code of chivalry in a time of such crassness and degeneration that we seem to be going through now? I mean, it, it makes it difficult sometimes to see how, how we are improving. Yes, and yet all the more reason to, to revive chivalry, isn't it? I mean, if the absence of these ideals requires of us that we, that we bring them up again, that, 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 that we you know, look back to these classical sources and also you know, endow this um, you know, effort to improve ourselves with the, the beauty of, of, a, of a prophetic tradition, of a, of a cultural heritage, that the lore, the stories, the practices, it forms a, a, a cohesive narrative that, that is inspiring. So rather than simply uh, undertaking um, kind of a solitary project of self-help, to feel that you're in the flow of this lineage of grace that has, after all, been passed down from heart to heart through the generations and, in fact, has been a basis for intercultural literary communication between Christendom and Islam and, and also Judaism, um, that, that's an inspiring uh, prospect. And, and uh, it, it, pro it provides a, a counterweight to, to the desolation of a very, of a very uh, uh, empty and, and, and bland uh, consumerism, a kind of hedonistic uh, throwaway culture of uh, moral relativism and, um, and uh, the mere uh, you know, apotheosis of, of power and, and privilege. The, the, the ideals in, in, in Futua um, drive home uh, the necessity of um, attaining that, that state of grace uh, that, will, that will justify our humanity. And, and that call, that clarion call, is, uh, I find very compelling as specifically as an answer to the ills of, of the, the society today. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm wondering with the meditative uh, 
uh, practice looks like and what you know what tomorrow would actually kind of look like. Oh yeah. Well, um, it's a little bit hard to to describe. I hope you can come tomorrow. Um, there are really stages of contemplative practice, so it's an unfolding process and it proceeds step by step. And um, certainly contemplative practice in Sufism um, uh, parallels contemplative practice in um, other traditions such as yoga. Um, if one would uh, differentiate between them at all, you might point to the primacy of the heart in Sufism. Uh, and, um, and, and, and also the primacy of love, which is of course associated with the heart. Love which is um, understood by a number of different terms, but the most um, uh, essential of these terms is the, 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 the word ishq, ishq which means passion, the divine passionate attraction, which is the the, the great creative emotion, the, the, the great longing that has brought forth this whole world. So whereas in some traditions, the world might be looked upon with some kind of Gnostic skepticism as a, as a fallen place, um, Sufism, um, recognizes the emotion of divine passion as a providential um, current that brought forth uh, this manifestation out of the emptiness. And so all, you know, not only philosophy, but also spiritual practice is oriented by a kind of positive valuation of the divine self-expression through manifestation. And so we learn to experience ourselves as, as witnesses to this unfurling of the potentiality that was once hidden away in the infinite, unseen and unknown, and by means of creation uh, is, is unfurled, is, is uh, given expression and therefore, our spiritual path um, represents a, uh, an opportunity, even an imperative, a, a necessity to fulfill our, our reason for being, uh, which was already communicated um, in pre-eternity when we were asked the question, uh, am I not your Lord? Am I not the one to whom you belong? And the, the soul answered, Bala, yes, yes, Shahidna, we, we, we witness it. And that, that yes sent the soul forth into creation down through the planes of being. And so contemplative practice in Sufism has to do with working out the implications of that original pledge, which is to say um, realizing our belonging to the absolute um, here in this manifest world by the awakening of those subtle faculties of perception whereby we can experience ourselves as the mirror in which the divine reality can reveal itself by reflection. And the heart is in the midst of that subtle anatomy which is composed of a, no a number of organs of, of, of subtle perception. The heart is, is the very crux and, and the the, the meeting ground between heaven and earth. So contemplative practice involves work with breath, visualization, chant, uh, the direction of thought and feeling uh, to cultivate inner faculties and to dynamize the heart. One more? Okay. Just to make sure everyone can hear the, the question. Um, first of all, thank you very much for, for being with us, Pirzai Anayat Khan. It's a great pleasure to have you with us here at Brown. 
Um, I'm the, the chaplain for the Muslim community at Brown, so uh, I have a few years of experience working with, uh, with, uh, with Muslim communities and the various um, uh, joys and, and issues that come with that. And, and one thing that, that we see in the community often is um, someone like me, I consider myself blessed and very in a, in a benefited place in the I benefited from teachers who uh, who taught me that uh, that this tradition of Islam ultimately has three dimensions and that Sufism is is the third dimension it's the dim dimension of the heart which is an essential part of, of this whole tradition uh, and yet uh, in in the community we often find people with a mindset um, that all Islam is is the rules is the laws uh, is, uh, is the fiqh, the, the jurisprudence, the do's and don'ts, so those kind of things. Uh, and so I was wondering um, uh, if you could shed light on, on two questions that I often have in the back of my mind. One, what do you see, uh, how do you see um, that this emphasis on the outer aspects, on, on, the, on the rules, uh, how is that appealing? Um, uh, what makes makes that appealing what kind of mindset uh, in someone makes that ap appealing to to believe that a tradition is is just this outer form this 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 law and not not spiritual and then uh, two for someone in that mindset um, um, how uh, how would you kind of present the tradition of Sufism uh, considering that many of them are kind of often in the mindset that Sufism is this other thing it's not part of Islam it comes from Buddhism it comes from these other traditions and and it's something that if we need to get back to pure Islam we need to completely uh, root that out of our communities so thank you very much and uh, any wisdom you could share on that would be very much appreciated okay. thank you thank you ah that's a wonderful question <laughs> yeah well, in the last years, I've uh, spent some time, um, usually every year, in, in Turkey. And it's interesting to observe the uh, resurgence of, of Sufism there. And speaking with um, Turkish Sufi friends, um, it's interesting to see how they uh, look upon the um, reforms that were brought about by Ataturk you know, in the early part of the, the 20th century. You know that Ataturk, um, he banned the Sufi uh, tariqats. He, he, he closed down the tekyes and um, you, he outlawed the, the garb of the Sufis and the, the titles, sheikh, and all of that. It was, uh, it was all um, banned. And uh, he was trying to secular secularize the Ottoman Empire and succeeded in actually uh, tr transforming uh, Turkey in some quite remarkable ways to the extent that um, most of the Turkish uh, friends that, that I know um, admire him very much. And all of these, or most of them, are Sufis themselves, Sufi practitioners. So those who, who follow the Sufi path happened to admire a leader who banned Sufism in Turkey. How, why is that? Um, and, and the reason seems to be, uh, according to what they say, is that um, Sufism had become rather corrupt. Dur in the later stages of, this, of, of the Ottoman Empire, these orders became these kind of powerful guilds that were very involved in politics, very entrenched, very uh, excessively ritualized. Sufism had kind of run into a rut. And um, Sufis have always been you know, worried that this might happen or have even you know, observed it happening themselves. Uh, a very early saying um, is that uh, Sufism was once a reality without a name that has become a name without a reality. <laughs> and um, you know, that was said in something like the 8th or ninth century. <laughs> so, so already Sufis have been worried about the routinization of Sufism to the point where it's Sufism in name only. So a lot of people in Turkey feel that um, Sufism was in a way purified by the banning of, of, of Sufism and that it's now re-emerging um, on new footing. And uh, so, you know, there's been a crisis in the Islamic world um, in the period that saw the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire and the coming of, of um, 
you know, Western imperial powers. This, these, these were, this was a civilization that had flourished, that had been at the forefront of the arts, of the sciences, and had considered Europe just a, a backwater, and now found itself um, completely overwhelmed uh, by this new force. And on the one hand, enchanted by these new prospects of, of technology and, and new social forms, and at the other, on the other hand, very um, you know humbled and uh, nostalgic for a prior era of, um, of success and, and, and power. And so this has given rise, that, that period of inner reflection gave rise to a number of new moves. And one of them is this kind of puritanical reformist tradition um, that has roots in, in medieval Islam, and it traced back to Ibn Taymiyyah, but you know, was really um, galvanized by um, the founder of the Wahhabi um, sect, and uh, which is known as Salafism nowadays. And that's the movement that's looking to try to reclaim what it imagines was some kind of original Islam without any cultural accretions, without any mystical um, elaborations, just a, uh, they would say, a pure Islam based on um, the Sunnah of the Prophet. However, that uh, effort to reclaim a pure Islam has been very selective and, and biased in its sources, <coughs> and um, in fact has thrown to the, the wayside the, the sort of considered uh, consensus of centuries of learned scholarship on the part of the ulama of Islam. And so even though it, 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 it presents itself as a kind of pure orthodoxy, it really runs counter to you know, long tradition. And, um, and it, it has um, established it itself um, precisely by attacking you know, the weak points of Su Sufism, which has become, in certain, in certain um, cases, um, uh, well, corrupted uh, or um, just fatigued. Um, Sufism is, has stood in need of a of a revival. There was a there was a uh, an era of uh, splendor that um, you know produced such figures as uh, Maulana Rumi, as Ibn al Arabi. There was, there was a golden age of Sufism. And um, subsequent centuries saw, yes, certainly the perpetuation of a, of a deep tradition of meditative um, absorption of a tr tremendous purity. Um, but at the same time, as a, let's say, as a cultural force, um, Sufism has waned due to a number of factors which would be too complex to, to explore here. But precisely the, 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 the failings of Sufism um, were ones that could be um, capitalized upon by that force which um, arose as its antithesis and which called for something preferable because infinitely more simple, understandable, an ideology that required mere adherence to, uh, to, to rules uh, and rules which um, in fact were uh, interpreted in, in the most narrow uh, and often self-serving kinds of ways. So uh, yes, what is the attraction of that? It's a very good question. Um, it's hard for me to find much attraction in it, but I suppose there is some, some uh, feeling of um, uh, security in uh, being told uh, what, um, what the rules are and following those rules and feeling that by doing so, one will secure a, a, a place in, in paradise. For the Sufis, the place in paradise is not the goal. <coughs> in fact, uh, Rabia, um, great woman saint of, of Basra, uh, used to go around with a, a torch in one hand and a bucket in the other hand. She said, what do you, do? people would say, what are you doing with that? And she said, this uh, torch is to, to burn down paradise and the water is to extinguish the flames of hell so that people will worship God for God. So the Sufi uh, path is a path of intimacy, of nearness, of, of love. And of course, there is, there is Sharia in Sufism because you begin with establishing yourself 
ethically in the world. You don't just dive into mysticism before you've established a way of life that is balanced, that is responsible, that responds to the needs of the community, that is in tune with the ethical principles that, you know, that weave together society. You begin with, with Sharia. Now, it, nowadays, you know, Sharia has become a very bad word. And that's because of certain interpretations of Sharia. But Sharia just means living in accordance with the ethical principles of, of revelation, which, which reflect the, 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 the commonwealth of, of humanity living harmoniously. And, and there are extremely uh, egalitarian, enlightened interpretations of, of Sharia, which have provided a basis for the, the, the peaceful and uh, prosperous um, coexistence, not only of Muslim peoples, but also mu Muslims, Christians, and Jews. There were certainly times when Jews were much happier to live in, in the Muslim world than they were to live in Christian Europe because they had a much uh, better um, uh, status there. So Sharia, in its, in its best interpretations, in its truest interpretations, really does, pr does provide a meaningful pattern f on the basis of which one then can go into an ever-deepening exploration of the inner worlds. So you begin with Sharia. But if, you, if Sharia becomes everything, if Sharia becomes your God, as it were, then that's not even Islam anymore. You, 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 that, that's shirk. You're replacing divinity with a rule book. And, and that's precisely the danger of those who, who divinize um, you know, the, the legal um, legislation.